Hey all, welcome to another um, thing, uh, Old Testament study, or Torah study, however you want to call it. Um, um, me and hello, oh, we're going to start at verse 20, I think we're at the beginning of either day 5 or day 6, um, I can't remember quite, although uh, as you'll see by the title card where we are. Um, the thumbnail. Um, but, uh, we, this session that we did was like, like over an hour and a half, almost two hours. Um, so I'm going to split it up into two episodes. Um, so we'll do, of course, this beginning, uh, intro, and then we'll do, have an extra outro, not extra, <laughs> but I guess you could call it either. Uh, so in some ways, although it's two episodes, it's a sort of a part one and a part two because it is extra long. I didn't think uh, you guys would really want to um, listen for two hours, almost two hours, uh, but maybe over two separate videos, that's better. Um, so they're all, both going to be about 50, 55 minutes, uh, depending. Uh, I think the whole running time for the two was like an hour and 48 or 43 minutes. Uh, although I did cut out a little bit because uh, we had a couple minor things in the recording where uh, Halal had to answer a phone call and I had to answer a phone call. And you guys really do want to listen to us answering phone calls. So that's cut out. And um, I guess that's about it for the intro. So on with things okay i just let me know when you button. let me know when you're ready well, i'm ready i hit the record button <laughs> so that's right. so well, so we genesis yeah. 120 we are in <laughs> that's right that's right Ooh, we are progress. going where we've never gone before let's see if we can get out of out of chapter one maybe we can you know uh, uh, get how many two. verses are in chapter one <laughs> We're, we're, we're on so. day four now, maybe five. Yeah. Uh, we we are actually on um, yeah five. So it says Vayomer Elokim Yisratzu Hamayim Sheretz Nefesh Chaya VeOf Yafef Al HaAvers Al Pinei Rakia Hashemayim, and God said uh, that the waters swarm forth. Swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in the expanse of the sky. So a couple of things. Number one, the word there, uh, the expanse of the sky, it's got the rakia, and rakia uh, more or less means like emptiness or void or something like that. Like it's a, it's it's you know it's 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 a, it's a, the separation between the waters above and waters below. Yeah, uh, how we had it earlier. Um, we also see that the waters you have the. Uh, he has swarms of living creatures, and it would seem that that not only do, do does it look like fish are going to come out of the waters, but maybe even birds are coming from the water, which is kind of weird. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, so well, that's um, well. It says uh, let the well. It says let the living forth give forth uh, its kind, whatever. Forget creatures. You just read it, and I forget. Jeez. <laughs> Uh, it says, uh, you mean, uh, let the waters swarm forth swarms of living creatures? Yeah, and then what does it say? It, does, it says also let the heavens or let, the sky? Let, let birds fly above the earth in the expanse of the sky. Yeah. So, yeah. to me, it would say they're both forming out of their element, for lack of a better way of saying it. it because, be, and but... that seems neat with, you know, with birds' wing, or bones being hollow. Right, but but the thing, but well, you know, um, possibly, and I'm not going to say you're wrong, but I will point out that yeah. it says the oath ya of faith, which means the vav connects to the thing that was said previously, and so if we understand it like that, then it could mean that we're actually saying that the uh, the swarming things in the waters and the birds, like they both come from the same source, which is water, yeah. and because the the vav connects the two of them. Let me see here if I have. Uh, Nefesh Haya. Let's see if anybody says anything interesting here. Uh, Rambam, or Rambam or Rashi say uh, uh, and, and that was just a matter of you know 
my little commentary. You know, I'm not sure what other. Well, I think most Christians wouldn't think that they formed out of in the water. I think they would have think they formed out of the sky, so to speak. Although there's not really anything tangible in the sky, so. <laughs> right, right. Um, I'm just trying to see. Are you trying to look up uh, some commentary on I'm this? looking at commentary real quick. I'm just seeing if anybody says what I just said. I'm pretty sure I've read that before. Yeah. In some ways it matters. In some ways it doesn't. They're here. Right. <laughs> right. There's a, big, so, there's a big discussion of what exactly swarming, th swarming things are. So, uh... And the, oh, okay, on the fifth day, the command of creation was given to the waters, and on the sixth day, it was given to the earth. If so, the expression and let fowl fly above the earth must be interpreted as being connected with the beginning of the verse, which has the following meaning. Let the waters swarm and swarms uh, uh, with swarms of living creatures and with fowl that will fly. In the verse stating, and the eternal God formed out of the ground every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, which seems to indicate the fowl were created from the ground, not from the water, must be understood as if it said, and the eternal God formed out of the earth every beast of the field. And he also formed every fowl of the air out of water. So here, uh, yeah. Rombaum is, is taking what I just said. Yeah. Um, there are many verses like this. So also in the, is the opinion of Rabbi Eleazar the Great in his chapters, where he says on the fifth day, he caused all weaned fowl to swarm from the waters. However, in the Gemara, the sages differ on this point. Some agreeing with previously mentioned interpretation say that all winged fowl were created from the waters, and some said they were created from both. In their words, they were created from the swamps. So if so, since the fowl sprang from the waters and the swamps are at the bottom of the ocean, this is why the command concerning the creation took place on the fifth day. So, you know, there is a debate. So uh, yeah. I wasn't wrong. I have uh, I have what to, to rely on with that. But, yeah. uh, you know. Yeah, it's not worth it, dying. It's it's just, uh, it basically comes down to some interpretation of how, you, you know, based on what you think the meaning of the, well, you know the meaning of the words, but the way that it's supposed to be meant, right? Well, look, you know, the thing is, is that when you read the Torah, the Torah is not always clear on, on the things that it says. Yeah. Because it There's doesn't a, tell you the scientific way things happen. It just tells you it happened. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, because... Sometimes, a lot of times. Well, there are, number, there are a number of reasons for that. Number one is because ultimately, it's not trying to give you a history of how the world was created. What it's really trying to do is is, 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 is establishing one, at least one point, and that is, is God created everything. Yeah. And uh, then it's also uh, sort of establishing dominions where things are separated to with the distinctions between one thing and another thing. So um, birds are a little bit odd because if, if, like you said earlier, if we're talking about where do birds, what is their element? Well, that would seem to be the air, but there's nothing in the air for them to uh, become part of. And so that leaves you with the ground and the water. And because you have that, excuse me, because of the way the Torah presents it, it had that vav in there. And that vav connects the first half with the second half. Yeah. And so you could you could read it, and you'd be right in reading it as meaning that the fish were created, but also were, the birds were created out of the water. Yeah. Um, but that a lot of that uh, depends on what do you mean by swarming things? What's a swarming thing? How do you define that? Yeah. And then you know, are we are we indeed connecting the two, or just because it says at the beginning, you know, one thing? Does, do we take that to be everything yeah. or perhaps it could be that the the birds are out of the air yeah. and then swarming things you know you can think of like bees you know they swarm right or something well, other and they're sort of flying things they're not quite like birds but you know well let me let me tell you the way that the, the tour the, the the commentators interpret the torah what they do is they look at how the word is used in other places in the tanakh yeah. so they're not so they're, they're not saying well we can use this word to mean this or this or this or that yeah, because the the Hebrew that was spoken in the day was going to change and, and, and alter, just like today's Hebrew is much different than the Hebrew of the uh, uh, of the Torah, yeah. right? Uh, there are a lot of words that are borrowed from other 
other uh, uh, nations, other cultures. languages, other cultures. Right. So we're not, we're so we're really ignoring that. What we're really paying attention to is when we say what's well, a swarming thing. Well, the answer's got to be found somewhere in the Tanakh, and that's what they then appeal to: is where yeah. where in the Tanakh do we hear this? Do we see this word appearing again, and how is it used? Yeah. And that's where the debate comes it, it comes from. And then I might be getting ahead of us a little bit here too, but with birds, there are birds that don't fly and that are just on land. So right. it, it could seem like some, what we classify as birds anyways. Um, you know, and I think they have a lot of same properties as birds that fly, but it seems like some sort of birds could have been created. Land birds, I guess you could call them. <laughs> Might have been created right. on the sixth day as well. Um, possibly, yeah. I mean, look, they, look, they take the, the insects and they they separate the insects into different types of creation. You know, like yeah. a swarming thing doesn't appeal, doesn't only refer to like fish. It can, it can also refer to actually, um, it can refer to uh, uh, things like, I think, frogs and, and, and different things as well. Yeah. So uh, like amphibians, it can also yeah. refer to amphibians, not just to like uh, things that are, really tied to the water yeah so basically it comes down to the classifications that we have today might have been different than the classifications that they had back then <laughs> oh well they're for sure like our scientific class like look listen all all classification systems are arbitrary yeah. it's just based on on how we want to um, classify them so that it's useful to us for example i'll give you one from the tana to from the, from the talmud and the Talmud discusses the seven laws of Noah. And the seven laws of Noah are the seven universal laws that everybody is supposed to keep. Uh, the Jews are supposed to keep them and the non-Jews are supposed to keep them. These are the seven universal laws. And and if you look at some of the discussions of the Talmud about it, it says in one place it says seven, and it says 33, and it says 66. And so uh, now generally people understand that to be, to refer to um, as uh, like topic headings, like, like, category heads but these seven laws uh are organized by the rabbis it, it's a it's, it's 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 a bunch of laws that are organized together so it, 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 it divided up within seven categories so yeah. that you can sort of understand easy reference of of uh where with the connection that these these, these uh, laws have yeah. so um so we have that, and then obviously the um, classifications within the, the Torah itself are actually given by God. Those are those are classifications given by God. So if you look at kosher versus non-kosher foods, those are classifications that only come from the Torah. And uh, you know, um, even blessings, yeah. uh, they're sort of the, the hint of the uh, uh, the core of the blessings that that is uh, in the Torah in Deuteronomy where it says you shall eat and you'll be satisfied and you'll bless the Lord your God. So this is the idea that after we eat, and there I think it specifically mentions bread, lechem, is that after you finish eating, then you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna bless God, right? And uh, it's an interesting thing. And I don't know why, 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 why Christians have this, um, that uh, you guys always do, uh, you, you do your, 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 your prayers before, before you start eating. Meal. You do the yeah, you do the blessing before the meal. But, Most of the time, we, well, I've come to learn that it's it can be said before, during, and after. <laughs> so okay, so we have specific we have a blessing before the meal and and at the end of the meal, but they have very different reasons. And the yeah. blessing at the end of the meal is connected to this idea of thanking God because now I've, I've, I've you've, you've blessed me with food and I feel, I feel satisfied or, or that you're, you're allowing me to live. The blessing at the beginning of, of the meal, though, is a recognition that everything in the world ultimately belongs to God yeah. and that we should uh, uh, ask permission before we partake of anything that in God's creation, yeah. um, which is interesting because was I reading Sota or was I reading the Parsha this week where it talks about... I don't know. I've lost my train of thought on that. But there's there something interesting I, I read this week that was uh, that was kind of fascinating. It's kind of along the lines of what we're talking about here. Yeah. But let's go on to verse 21. Okay. Vayivarai Elohim et ha-tanim 
הגדולים ואת כל נפש חי הרומשת אשר שרצו המים למיניכם ואת כל עוף כנף למיניהו למיניהו וירא אלוקים כי טוב. Now the funny thing about this is this morning I was studying with my son he had a test today a Mishnah and I was uh, we were studying it together and I was reading it in Hebrew and my son said uh, he, I go I go so what does that mean he goes I don't know and I go what do you mean you don't know you know you should know your Hebrew better than me and he goes I don't know and so he looked at the word he goes he goes ah but you just say things funny right you pronounce the the words funny and so uh you know it's like well you know okay uh that, that's probably true because you've grown up I mean he, we've been here since he was three so he's grown up reading Hebrew yeah. whereas for me you know uh it's a it's second language that, it's definitely a second language for me maybe you know? a third so, <laughs> right well yeah I've got two two versions of, of English that I'm working on um you know uh, uh country he, he uh, English and then uh uh suburban English so yeah. uh well anyway. I, I thought you also might have learned some Spanish when you were in the states too so no I, I know basura my wife knows Spanish though my my wife knows Spanish. She knows sign language. Uh, she knows Hebrew, English, and I, th I think I'm leaving one out. Uh, my daughter knows uh, Hebrew and English, and she's learning a little Japanese, or she was at one point. Yeah. And uh, she likes languages as well. well. Anyway, so what does this verse mean? Verse 21. And God created the great sea creatures, and every so every every living soul, I guess you could say, and that creeps. Uh, which the waters swarm forth of all kinds and every winged bird of every kind God saw that it was good. Okay, so uh, here we learn the great sea creatures. Uh, it says uh, Taninim. So some people understand that this is talking about whales. Others understand this is talking about the Leviathan. Um, yeah. That uh, or, some, uh, and, or so, stuff like maybe whales and Leviathan as big, you know. Right, right, and so uh, stuff uh, maybe like plesiosaurs and stuff like that. Well, yeah, I, I don't know, um, maybe, but, but it's definitely talking about the great sea beast, whatever that is. Um, and uh, the, the ending, the Yud Mim ending, is a masculine ending, um, and uh, that indicates that. Uh, uh, of course, you always do uh, when there's a male and a female in Hebrew. You always uh, give it the, the masculine gender when you're talking about multiple. So if you have male and female together, you always have a, a masculine ending. If you have all females together, you have a feminine ending. So yeah. uh, you know, so this would be an idea of like possibly pairs here because when we talk about um, uh, the yud mim ending at the end of, of Hebrew words, for in, end of nouns. Uh, it usually means it's usually assumed to be being two, and if it means more than two, it's usually specified somewhere in the text. Uh, like they'll say, you know, get a lim, shlos get a lim or something, shlosim get a lim or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you probably find a little bit of that referenced in uh, the story of Noah when he's told to take the, all the animals two by two and do the ark, except for uh, the clean animals, which then he's supposed to take. Uh, seven of, I believe. Seven. Would be would, um, and I know it's getting out of order, but would that be seven pairs or just seven? <laughs> yeah, se seven pairs for sure. So fourteen. Yeah. Of kosher animals. One male, one female. <laughs> right, which meant that he had fourteen giraffes on the ship. Oh wow! Did you did you realize that giraffes are actually kosher? No, I did not. Yes, I think you've only... told it to me before. I think I vaguely remember hearing you say it to me before, but of course I forgot. <laughs> well, that's and of okay. course it's, they it's were unusual. they were probably all well. Uh, we differ a bit on this, but I think they all would have been young giraffes. <laughs> so, well, you know, we actually have a a, a, a place in the town where it discusses um, Noah's Ark. Yeah. Uh, the, the first thing is is that one of the biggest obvious criticisms most people have for the story of Noah's Ark is that there's not enough room yeah. to fit all the animals in the world on the, on the, on the Ark. Yeah. And that, and that seems like a pretty obvious uh, criticism. Well, 
I mean, the rabbis who are, are, are really meticulous in their readings of the, the Torah um, obviously understood that this, that this was a problem. If you sat down and you, and, and, and you figured out how big the ark was, that there wasn't enough room to fit all the animals in there. Yeah. And well, it, well, it depends. Well, I know you're going to say, uh, but it also depends on how you figure, you know, like if you took babies or not babies, but say ad, young ones, you know, they're all that way. They're all smaller. Um, and what else was going to say? Something about the size, too, but I forget what. Oh, the for the number. It, it wouldn't be all of what we have today, you know, like you wouldn't have two of every breed of dog, you know, you'd have two dogs. Right, but the thing is, though, is if you still, but even still, if you took all the species that do exist, as far as, if you had, like, a base version, a base pair, right, that yeah. everything sort of, like, uh, split off from later, you've still got so many animals in the world that there's no there's there's no way they would fit on the ark. Even if they're babies, even, if, you know, if you, if you want to be, if you want to, you know, still be in the argument, you really want to yeah. uh, Actually, look uh, at them. I've heard people figure it out, and actually, with the young, them being young and all that, and you know, base pairs, it's very possible that there would have been enough room. But, well, the, the 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 answer that the Talmud gives is is that actually, um, the ark and the um, the temple uh, both enjoy the first temple enjoy the same miracle, and that was um, that. Um, there was enough room. Yeah. It, the, 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 there was a miracle, and that, that was there was enough room. And that what that means is is that yes, the, the, the ark was of a fixed size, but um, it's a little bit like the TARDIS, right? Yeah. Like the idea is kind of like it's the TARDIS. Like like yeah, it's a certain size on the outside, but when you get in there, there's plenty of si plenty of room. And you know, adults or not adults or whatever. You know, it, it, there's plenty of room for everything to fit, just like in the temple. Yeah. Uh, there's a there's a point where you in the prayers where you, you you bow down and you prostrate yourself fully on the ground where you're sticking your, your hands out and your legs out. Um, we don't pray like that anymore, but that we, we did we did it one time, and that you know during the high holidays, you know people are going in there and that's where they're they're supposed to be at, and there's there shouldn't be enough room in the temple for everybody to fully prostrate themselves. But in fact, they were able to do that, and it's for the same reason. So those are actually two. They have the two same miracles. Now, here's the thing: is I think that we've gotten to a. Uh, I think we've made a mistake. So I think that what a lot of people have have gotten in the habit of doing, and I think this is a mistake, is that they look for answers to how to understand the Bible that are within the boundaries of what we understand. Uh, from a purely rationalistic scientific perspective. Yeah. And and that's a mistake because ultimately we don't believe in pure rationalistic science because we believe in God. And science yeah. is a discipline that cuts God out because ultimately it's not a discipline focused on studying God. It's not theology. Yeah. It's a discipline on understanding how the world works. Yeah. And there is for sure there are natural processes in the world. Yeah. But um, the way we understand it is that God, who create, who's the author of all natural processes, yeah. can make those processes active when he wants and inactive yeah. or change and alter them when he wants to. Yeah, he and, can uh, supersede the natural laws when he needs to or wants to, however you want well, to put it. Well, I wouldn't even say supersede. I would, I would, just, I would just say, for example, there's a story of uh, a rabbi who... Um, he ran. He he ran out of oil. I want to say for Hanukkah, and he said, uh, "May the one who makes oil burn, let water burn." And that's what happened. The water burned like oil, because it, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter um, what things should or should not do, or whether you know the, the water shouldn't burn. But God is the one who said that oil burns. So why can't He also say? Water burns, right? Yeah. He said oil burns. Well, he can say water burns as well. Yeah. But that's but that's a temporary suspension. And the reason why these things are temporary. And, and that's why things, I use the term supersede just for, you know, like a supernatural, supernatural thing to do or whatever, however you want to say it. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I guess what I'm saying is, is that um, 
maybe I'm misunderstanding the word supersede, but I, but I, but I understand. I don't understand. I, my understanding is is that supersede would would would, would uh, indicate a suspension of natural laws. Where what I'm saying is is that water burning it can also be just as much a natural law as oil burning. It's because the 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 the, the person who says that oil burns can also say that water burns. It's the same yeah. person because he's the one who created oil and created created water. Yeah, but so, he's do, he would be doing that temporarily, thus superseding the normal law. Okay. Maybe. I mean, I, I, maybe we can use that word. I, I guess what, I, what I'm saying is, yeah. what if it wasn't temporary? What if he decided that from now on? Could, he, could, it, could it be that he could decide from now on oh, that yeah. rocks glow in the, the dark from now on? Oh, yeah, and, he, he could, uh, God, of course, could always change things, you know, like, um, we're going to be getting into it a little bit later on. If you go by some scripture, um, you know, with, um, um, we'll say the fall, what I call the fall, I know, as you were saying on a previous thing, you guys don't call it the fall, uh, but when it says about, you know, bushes getting thorns on it, so there wasn't thorn, that would seem to indicate that before that point there wasn't thorns you know so right. now he's made bushes to have thorns on and the snake or, used to have legs and arms and now it doesn't <laughs> well, he was very concerned about your mother's day so that was very nice of him yeah uh, but, but anyway so i mean we can uh, we can go back and forth on, on supersede or not supersede but yeah i, I think the, i think the point is is that i think what i see is is that people look sometimes for uh a rational, what they call a rational explanation, yeah. to the exclusion of the possibility that actually the rational explanation is what the text literally says. That is the rational explanation. Yeah. Um, God, God it, worked. <laughs> God, God did whatever it is he did, you know, and, and, it, yeah. and that's the way things happen. And that's just like, you know, I know that, you know, when I was younger in college, I was really worried, bothered by the idea of the six days of creation. Did do the six days of creation in the Torah literally mean six days of creation, or does it is it is it some kind of metaphor, is it some sort of uh, you know analogy or something like that? And at the very least, I think what you have to say is if you claim to believe in the Torah, you have to be open to the possibility that when the text says the, the earth was created in six days, then it literally means it was created in six days. Yeah. Because if you don't, then what you're saying is that uh, that that uh, God is limited in His power by nature. That nature ultimately is greater than God, and that we that our understanding of nature uh, is 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 uh, actually at such a profound level uh, that we can reject something, uh, even though our scientific uh, understanding of the universe is constant is changing. For example, uh, I saw something, and I don't know if this is true, or I didn't really investigate it, but there's an idea that uh, I think Neil deGrasse was, was saying, Tyson was saying something along the lines that uh, our universe might be within a black hole, uh, and that therefore the, the Big Bang Theory might be wrong. I, I, I don't know if that was just one of those YouTube titles that was meant to, you know, get you to click on it, to clickbait or, or, or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, I, for years I've, I've felt... And I've cautioned people who, who, who want to make uh, the creation account work within the context of Big Bang, cos Big Bang cosmology. And yeah. I try to tell them that, you know, don't get too attached to any sort of scientific theory uh, on, on things because those things change. We, we, we know so little about the universe yeah. that the scientific process is far from concluded. And every time people think that we're done on a certain question, yeah. New information is, is discovered where we have to rethink everything. Yeah. And so we have that and we have the the, 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 the very uh, stable understanding of the Torah that gives the explanation. Yeah. Jack, uh, we think we know a lot about the universe, but we probably know like 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% of this universe. <laughs> absolutely. We have no idea. We don't know what we know. We don't know how smart, how knowledgeable we are. We don't know how ignorant we are. That's our, our situation. Yeah. And therefore, therefore, the, the question of using science or scientific theories of the process of 
the universe coming to be to discredit the Torah is foolish. Yeah. Um, we have to use something else when we, we you know, yeah. um, I believe that when it comes to answering questions on religion or whatever, that we have to be very careful on what we allow to discredit uh, notions of God. But we also have to be careful not to just accept everything. And I see yeah. people doing that as well. And that's also a problem where you just kind of like, well, there's a slim chance this would work out. And he's like, well, you know, yeah. pardon me, but, you know, I, I don't know that I want to commit my life to a slim chance of something, right? I want to have a good, solid uh, uh, reason to yeah. believe what I believe. Just, just the, you know, the universe coming into uh, existence by God is supernatural, you know? You know, the, we know the world couldn't come to be by natural, oh, I would say anyways, we know the the universe couldn't come to be by natural means. It's just impossible. Well, you know, it depends on how you define that na na natural. Excuse me. It depends yeah. on how you define natural. Like, if nature is is includes only those things that we can see with some form of of our senses, or that we can in indirectly observe, uh, then. Yeah, anything not fitting in that is supernatural. If, however, a natural means uh, what we can see and can't see, then that's a totally different matter as well. And so it, sometimes the, the, the way we understand and define words and how we use words is important. Yeah. Because otherwise, you know, I found, I, I think I've always found that people accept the other person's argument and lose the argument because they haven't really thought clearly about well, wait a second, how did I agree to this version of the use of this word? Because you, by using the word in that way, you have you have set up the argument so there's no way I can actually win it. Yeah. What we have, to, we have to do is we have to set up, uh, uh, we have to use words in a way that both of us can agree to. Now, I don't yeah, we need to define that, our terms, <laughs> our definition. Right, now, now, we don't have to define every term, yeah. but... Whenever we get stuck and we're having a, a, a problem, we should think about, well, what is it, what is the problem between us? And if it is a the, the, the use of terms, then we should definitely define our term. Like, I'll give you an example even between you and I. Like, the Jewish definition of Messiah is very different than the Christian definition of Messiah. Yeah. We have two different definitions of the word Messiah. Yeah. And if we don't recognize that from the beginning... There's no way that we can have an intelligent conversation between us. Yeah. Because you're going to be thinking, this guy's an idiot. He, How can he not see that, you know, Jesus is the Messiah? You know, we've got the same text. Why can't he see it? And yeah. on the other hand, the Jews looking at the Christian going, this guy's an idiot. How can he think that Jesus is the Messiah? He doesn't fulfill, yeah. fulfill the criteria. You know, so, so yeah, it's kind we got of the same. Thing. We got the same text. We're just interpreting it in different ways. We've Based got different ways that we different reasons, <laughs> right? And so then, before we can actually have a discussion on who's right and who's wrong, we have to be at the very least be aware of the fact that we don't agree on the on the definition of certain words. Yeah, and you know, and so that that becomes more productive when we have those discussions. Yeah. So I think it's the same way with anything, and and I think yeah. that when it comes to using the word nature or su nat natural or supernatural, like it's like. You have to be careful. What do you mean by that? Are we talking yeah. about? And usually, I think most people assume that we're talking about in the context of a scientific understanding of nature, which precludes from the get-go um, supernatural phenomena or non-physical phenomena, things that can't be explained with a microscope or with yeah. indirect observation. Um, although, in some ways, uh, I would argue that actually. Um, we have both direct and indirect um, observational material uh, of God that yeah. we can that we can refer to. Yeah, um, but that's a, that's a completely different that's a completely different uh, topic. So let's let's try to let's push on because I want yeah, to get yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking we've gone down this rabbit hole so far. I'm not sure whether we can get back. <laughs> that's right. Oh, there's one but, thing I want well, to point uh, out. Did is, we finish verse 21 there? <laughs> well, there's one There's one last point I want to make, and that is, is that it says, and God created Vayera, uh, the great seed beast. And Vayera, as we know, we talked about this in chapter one, the word bara in Hebrew means creation from nothing. And so uh, supposedly, according to the Ramban, 
the things that were created from nothing were created at the very beginning of the creation process. And that was the heaven and the earth. And so, but what about what do we do with this part here? And the argument is, is that, that, that this is just a throwback. This is just connecting us back to the first act of creation where these things already existed in potential uh, back yeah. there. They were specifically, uh, their potential was already created. Okay, 22. By Rechotam Elohim, Lemur Puruvu, Umilu, Et Hamayim, Bayamim, Behaof, Yerev, Baaretz. God bless them, saying, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and the birds multiply on the earth. Wait a second. Be fruitful, multiply. Who does this also send to? Uh, <laughs> humans later. Humans. Yeah. So wait, this is kind of weird, right? He's saying it to be fruitful, and multiply to fish and birds, <laughs> or at least at the very least, fish, right? Yeah. Well, it's. I would multiply. say it's a. It ends up being a core command for all of living creatures. And I'm using that term living a little loosely, not like living as in humans, but, you know, you know, he wants the earth to be populated with lots of stuff, lots of animals, lots of people, whatever. So, you know, it, it ends up being a core command that, you know, well, in our innermost it, being it, here, it says it's a blessing yeah. and he blessed them. So it's not a command. It's a blessing here. Yeah. Well, right? by a command I'm using is loosely. <laughs> well, Rick, you can't do that. <laughs> Haven't we been learning together long enough for you to know that I take commands as a very specific <laughs> word that has a very specific meaning? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. that blessings has a very specific meaning to it? So <laughs> well, it, well, a command can be a blessing, too. I mean, I, I mean, in what way that is not kind of like... Uh, doesn't involve pot. Pot? Yeah. Like, did you have to kind of smoke some pot and then everything becomes, like, interesting and in, in, in depth? Like, the, the lines between things begin to blur together into a beautiful cosmic haze. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure whether I'm getting what you're trying to say here. How a command becomes... Un well, what I'm, saying, I'm, saying, I'm saying, how is a command and a blessing higher than the same thing? Well, I'm not saying they are the same thing necessarily, but I'm saying a command can be a blessing. But then again, you could have a command as a curse too. You know, it depends on what you're being commanded to do. Like, well, that's what I'm asking. Like, what do you mean by that? Well, in the fact that, you know, um, you multiplying and having babies and all that is, I would say, a bless, as you said, a blessing, you know, it, you know, uh, it says many times in scripture, I think, that a man whose quiver is full is blessed, you know. Right, But at the same time, he's interjecting it. He's telling them to be fruitful, multiply. Maybe command is too strong of a word. Well, I mean, I think it's the wrong word here. Like, there is a debate. I'll tell you this. There is a debate whether the, uh, be fruitful, multiply is a command or not. And um, the rabbis have this, this debate. But the, generally speaking, if you just look at the text, he says, and he blessed them. And a blessing is, is it can be independent from a commandment. Yeah. Because, uh, because commandments are things you're just supposed to do. And if you do them, there are good consequences. If you don't do them, there are bad consequences. But it's a, different from a blessing. A blessing is something where... Like, God didn't have to do this. It's something extra. Yeah. He's blessing to be fruitful and multiply. He's making it to where he's saying, look, you guys need some help. And I, I think ultimately this goes back to how how do you understand this verse, what it's saying. And yeah. uh, one of the commentaries I read says that when it talks about be fruitful and multiply, the blessing, the, the blessing is actually necessary <laughs> because, um, because the nature of, let's say, for example, fish, is that it's very dangerous being a fish and you would hate for your species to be wiped out so you need this blessing to be fruitful and multiply so there's a lot of you so that even though some of you are eaten there are a lot of you that are left yeah although at the time that he's telling them this 
um, they wouldn't be eaten for food initially. They will be eventually. The fish are. Uh, did we have? Were we eating fish prior to? Uh, I'm not talking about humans. I'm talking about other fish. fish yeah. Are eating. Well, were they even eating each other prior to? I I would say I presume so. Yeah. Um, Just I because I think also... uh, when uh, Noah got off the ark, he he said to man that you know about you know the meat you know like you know. Right, flash but, meat. The, but I think he said to the animals too, at that point too. So the SAR well, is be wrong. If I'm the SAR right. uh, applies to uh, birds and land animals. Uh, it doesn't apply to to fish. Um, it's 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 a, it's a, it's, 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 it's not a term that's applied to fish. What? That's so why. Basar. Basar means meat, flesh. Right. Okay. That word basar is used to, 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 uh, in connection with birds and with land animals, but it's not used for fish. So this is kind of a, a di this is again where we have a different method for categorization. Yeah. Right. That can, can lead to a little bit of uh, a confusion here. So um, fish are, are, are definitely different. And I don't know that it's really, we're really told one way or the other whether fish are eating each other or not eating each other. Like, the, yeah. the, um, I, I think that they probably are. I don't, you know, the, the idea, I think, in the garden, the reason that animals weren't e eating each other is uh, one, probably more of a safety precaution. And that's even ignoring the idea that maybe that the, that the only animals that weren't eating each other were the ones in the garden. It could be the wild animals outside the garden actually were eating each other. I think that's I think that's vague. I don't know that. Yeah, it, it's a possibility. It, but then I would say, if, if I'm remembering correctly, with this Noah story, would they have been eating each other outside of the garden at that point? Because it, if I like I said, if I'm remembering correctly, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it wasn't till after Noah came off the boat or the ship, whatever you want to call it, that the command was being given to, I think, animals and man that they could now eat one another. <laughs> well, I, I think, I think number one, we're about to read uh, in verse 23 or 24 about uh, the permission to eat food. Yeah. Uh, or it could be after Adam is created. I'm not sure. But there is, it does mention, it does tell us what permissions there exist. Yeah. The question is that, is that a, a behemoth and a chayov uh, there are two different types of animals. One's like domesticated, another is is uh, wild. Uh, and um, there, now there is the argument uh, about what were the, the, the animals eating the ark. But again, another miracle that perhaps they were vegetarian on the ark. Although uh, before they got on the ark, maybe they weren't vegetarians. Um, but uh, um, I don't know. Let's let's try to get to that verse, and then we can <laughs> yeah, talk <about> yeah. <laughs> Too so, easy to do these rabbit trails. <laughs> it's very easy. Well, but, you know, it, it goes in conjunction with what we're reading. At least that's what we just discussed, I think, a little bit. Right, right. Well, it's, I mean, and it's good discussions, good good things to think about, too. Yeah. Okay, so it says uh, in verse 23, And it was evening, it was morning, a fifth day. All right, now then, let's look at verse 24. Yeah, that, uh, that's an easy verse, eh? <laughs> for twenty thirty. We we've discussed that verse quite a few times in different uh, verses. Uh, <laughs> so it goes on in verse twenty-four. Mm -hmm. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, livestock, creeping things, and wild animals of every kind, and it was so. So here we see that the uh, that these animals are all born from the earth, yeah. right? Just like fish are born in the water, uh, land animals are, are, are born from the earth, yeah. and uh, we're going to find out that humans are also likewise born from the earth. Yeah. Okay. And so, uh, so here we have. I just want you to say, I just want you to know that that uh, nefesh kaya is like means living creature. 
living like, creature. It, it, it's too. It's like a, it's, it's a phrase. Nefesh Kayat, living creature. Yeah. Uh, Lamina, according to his kind, like the animal. Yeah. Like the livestock. Behema. Here they translate as livestock, and the reason why is behema usually refers to like domesticated animals. And so, uh, so um, here nefesh uh, nefesh haya is quote unquote like a general term referring to things that are about to be mentioned. And so then, it, as it goes on, it says, according to this kind, behema, right, domesticated animals. And I, I would actually literally read it that way because I feel like that's going to make things clearer as you go along. Yeah, it but, well, it's interesting that even right from the beginning, there seems to be domesticated li uh, animals, livestock, you know. Absolutely. W while, you know, you would think they would all be, quote, unquote, wild, you know. You well, know. you have to ask, you know, here's a question I've always asked myself, and I'm sure there are people out there who have studied this in depth. They have an answer that will make me look ignorant for even asking the question. But I'm going to ask the question anyway, you know, even though I have run the risk of looking like an ignoramus. Have you ever wondered why we don't have domesticated lions? Why don't we Not have... Not really, but... <laughs> Just because... Well, look, we have, we have cats and dogs. Yeah, that are domesticated. Yeah, small cats, maybe right. some medium sized. But why are those? Why why can we domesticate those and not domesticate? But like it's like they're born to be domesticated. It's not that every time you raise a dog or a cat, there's kind of a questionable period they go through where you have to worry that they're going to rebel against you, and possibly eat you. You don't really have that problem with them. Yeah. But with lions and other uh, wild creatures. You do have that problem. It's it's very every every animal you raise, you have to raise it and, and train it to not hurt you. You yeah. have to actually train it, but you don't have to train dogs and cats not to hurt you. That's um, what makes them domestic. I'm not sure whether you, you do, but you don't. Uh, maybe just being brought up with you the way that they're, um, they are their nature, which I guess would go with sort of what you're saying you know but maybe that's been bred into them well i think know, it's obviously because, the um, because they're because of their personalities like it's like you know the only time that a dog let's say you find a dog uh that doesn't is, doesn't have an owner and it's never been it was born as a puppy right and our i'll, I'll use cats because we have a lot of feral cats around here okay yeah they're they're, they're born uh Around garbage cans over here, there's they're, they're all over the place. Of these wild cats, yeah. so they they're still domestic. Like they're not trying to hunt you. They're not trying to hunt your child, right? They come up to you and they beg you for food, you know, and and, 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 and they act as you know as domestic as as a cat on the inside. Now they might bite you because they, they because living um, living outside of a house where they just depend on their own survival. It has made them more feral, but yeah. that's really going. That's that, but just like a human, you kick a human out of a loving family, and they raise themselves on the streets where they're having to fight for survival. They're also going to be more feral. Yeah. So what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, is that there seems to be something about cats and dogs that they're naturally domestic. Yeah. Whereas if you took lions and even smaller animals like weasels or guinea pigs or, you know, those things, they're not really domestic. They're always going to have this very strong, wild nature to themselves, even yeah. if a guinea pig is going to cower in fear. Fear, but you know, but I'm, but I'm just yeah. saying that that why is it that we only have like dogs and cats? Well, I well for most cats and dogs that we have that are in our house, that you know, I, the reason I'd say they wouldn't hunt like a person is because they're just bigger. They they know they're not more powerful. Well, first off, I'm being a little facetious. Yeah. But what, I, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to express though, is that you don't really have to worry about the aggression yeah. of a of a dog and a cat. Like yeah. they're gonna they're going to uh, assimilate into family into the family very quickly. Yeah, most of them. There are some dogs out there that you I think you have to worry about, but for the most part. Well, those are dogs that were bred to be fighting dogs. Yeah. They were they were bred in such a way where they're supposed to be more aggressive. Yeah. And so that's I mean so that's that's a little bit that's that's us, that's us you know 
purposefully breeding them to be more wild, to be more like wolves, right? They're more yeah. like, like a wolf. So, but let's so, talk, to let's me, a wolf and a dog, a dog are wolf. To me, wolves are dogs. They're just wild. But let's dogs. let's not miss let's not miss the the forest and the trees. Yeah. Like my point my point is at the yeah. end of the day, we have cats and dogs, which seem to naturally be domestic. Yeah. And, and these are eaters. I mean, these are like I mean they, they they're meat eaters. We have cows and we have other uh, animals that we that we raise for milk and food and, and different things. Uh, they are also naturally domestic. And then yeah. we have other animals that it's very difficult to domesticate them. Yeah. Usually they require a lot of special training from a young age to yeah. train them to behave in a certain way. And so my, yeah. my, so what I would expect, though, is that is that if the way is explained that we have dogs, the dogs were ultimately originally wolves, and over time we eventually domesticated the wolves, and that's why we have dogs and we have wolves. So... Wolves are ultimately undomesticated dogs, and dogs are domesticated wolves. But somehow or another, that trait of domesticness has been passed down uh, through the bloodline. Yeah. Whereas it, it doesn't get passed down through the for, – for wolves, it's, it's, they're always wild. Why haven't we domesticated more animals than we've had? Yeah. According, uh, according uh, to the I've natural seen. way of things, we do thousands and thousands of years to domesticate things. But we've chosen only dogs and cats. Yeah. Well, there are some people have chosen other stuff, but uh, well, we've seen domesticated, say, elephants before. You know, more in well, India. I'm not saying they don't, look, I'm not saying they don't exist. Like, I mean, the Talmud talks about seeing eye monkeys, right? Like, yeah. like we we have, but 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 it's different. A, yeah. a, a monkey or an elephant, by nature, is going to be wild and want freedom, and is not going to want to be domestic. Yeah. Right? Well, I think it also depends on, you know, like every, you know, uh, whatever and his brother, you know, uh, can't easily have a dog feed a dog. You know, it's not like everybody can have an elephant and feed an elephant. <laughs> easy. Monkey, maybe, yeah. You could probably deal with a monkey fairly I mean, easy. I mean, I mean, you could take even small animals. You take weasels, you could take badgers, you could take a lot of different animals that yeah. are small. You could purchase and raise and domesticate and people just don't do it. Yeah. And the question is why not? Why why hasn't that become why don't we have uh pet badgers? Yeah, more, or more often, you know, the, like there's some people that do obviously, but Well, well, I again, I think you're you're getting lost. You yeah, know, yeah, I'm getting lost, getting lost on here. I'm just you're, you're why getting, you're, we, you're, why have we stuck to cats and dogs? Right. Well, at least here, like if we they, have, if we uh, have the ability if we have the ability to domesticate wolves into becoming dogs, and we have the ability to domesticate small cats into becoming domestic cats, then we should have also been able to do that with other types of wild animals, but we don't see it. Now, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure somebody's going to say, wow, we have these 14 species of domestic animals in other places of the world. But I, I'm just saying that, generally speaking, there are domestic animals and their wild animals. And yeah. even here, from the very beginning in the Torah, it recognizes that there are two categories of animals, those that are domestic and those that are not. Yeah. So if we go back here, so it says Bahama, and then it says, and Remus, the creeping things, and uh, and Vichaito, Eretz, wild animals. Vichaito, like high, means like living, you know, we say Am Yisrael Chai means it, it means uh, the nation of Israel lives high. Yeah. <clears throat> but they live so much that they're like they're wild. It makes them wild, according to its kind. So, uh, and it was so. So here it's just an interesting thing where we're already starting off that there's a difference between domestic and wild animals. Yeah. And and let's see if that has any impact on your question about food. So that is the end of part one um, of this episode. Um, although, well, part one of these this session, because it, like I said, it was two set, one session, and I'm dividing it into two because of the top length. Um, so uh, we ended on uh, the discussion of you know about Noah's Ark. So, well, something that goes into that of the domestic and wild animals that seeming like there was 
versions of the animals, wild versions of the animals from the start, and domestic. That was interesting. I do believe we will continue a little bit of it into the beginning of the next video and then on to other stuff uh, because I think we only got, if I remember, uh, to verse 25 um, with the next second part of this, of course, we will finish all of chapter one, which will bring us to the end of day six. But you don't need to know about that till the next video. So uh, again, thanks for watching. Make sure you hit the like button, share this out and subscribe. If you're not subscribed, follow whatever it is on whatever platform you're watching this on. Hopefully you enjoy this series. Uh, so again, thank you very much for watching and we'll catch you on the next one, which Hopefully we'll be up in a couple days. Um, it's fairly easy to put this stuff together. So bye for now. God bless. Love you all. Have a great and wonderful day.